this world, there is real evil. In the darkest shadows and in the most ordinary places. These are the true stories of the innocent and the unimaginable. For the Beckwith family, a new home means new beginnings. Until something from the past returns to haunt them. The family calls in a team of renowned psychic investigators to make contact with restless spirits and fight the wrath of an unholy demon. Between the world we see and the things we fear, there are doors when they are opened. Nightmares become reality. The rural countryside of Connecticut harbors a remarkable number of haunted houses. Here, where the Naugatuck River empties into the Housatonic, Native Americans have lived for thousands of years. In 1642, Europeans began settling here as well. Today, in the historic towns of Seymour and Derby, the legions of dead beneath the land far outnumber the living. And local hauntings have become legendary. In the late summer of 1998, the Beckwith family visits the Naugatuck Valley, hunting for a home. Sean, a heating and air conditioning repairman, and Bonnie, a registered nurse, want more living space for their two teenage daughters and young son. They find themselves drawn to a repossessed house, abandoned for more than a year, that lists for such a low price it seems too good to be true. Most of the family is enthusiastic, except Bonnie's oldest daughter, who has a premonition. My daughter said, I don't want to go there. There's something wrong with that house. I laughed and told her, come on now, it's a house. You haven't even seen it yet. Come on, come on. it's going to be fun. If we had known then what we know now about this house, we wouldn't have thought twice about turning around. The real estate agent, Linda DeFord, opens the door. The family explores the hulking 19th century house. decide whether to take the house. We asked all the kids, what do you think? Is this the one? We love it. What do you think? My oldest daughter was the only one to say no. She said, it's evil. I don't want to live there. I don't want to be here. Bonnie feels confident that in time, her older daughter will accept the new house. They decide to take it and move in. The younger children are excited about having their own bedrooms. Nine-year-old Jeremy and 15-year-old Jennifer. I put my bed right against the window. I thought it would be nice to be able to lay in bed and look out the window and have a nice view. I was very happy in that room. It was small and it was very me. It wasn't located right above my parents. I was a teenager and I wanted to kind of be isolated by myself.
I heard noises. It's a big drafty house. What kind of it was understandable that he would be frightened, of course. So we really didn't think anything of it. Bonnie tries to calm his fears and gently takes him back to his bedroom. I'll tell you what. You know that flashlight that yeah. we got you? Can you get that for me? Sure. You know I had that? given him one of those toy flashlights with the three color lenses. And I told him, well, you say your prayers, and if you think the monster's in your room, you put the green lens on, and that makes him go away. It's a magic flashlight. Point the green light. And of course, he bought into it. All right. You see anything there? No. Mm -mm. I don't either. Jeremy seems reassured, and Bonnie goes back to bed. Then, later that night. This went on every night, the same time, around 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock, he would wake up screaming. Hi. Where are you Where going? going? I have to meet a teacher. I'll eat a granola bar. I made bacon and eggs. You asked for it. Last night, when I ran into your room, the next morning, Jeremy tells his mother the disturbances got worse. So did you try the flashlight? It kept happening, and it was really scary. She is unsure how to comfort him. As weeks go by, Jennifer, too, begins to feel twinges of fear. At first, I would kind of ignore it, kind of shake off the feeling that something was looking at me, something was just staring at me. It's almost like somebody's watching your every move. He would say, you know, somebody's grabbing the blankets and pulling them off of my bed. Somebody's calling my name, and I can't get it to stop. And he would shake, and he would be very scared. I would just say, you know, go back to bed. Uh, you're, you're having a nightmare. You're dreaming. There's nothing here. You don't have to be scared. There's nothing that's going to hurt you. I'm going to sleep with Mom and Dad. They're going to be mad at you. Later that night... I'm feeling a fist come through my mattress. And it's not humanly possible. When the Beckwiths move into a haunted house, two of the children find themselves under attack. I knew what I felt, and I was very certain of what I felt and how it felt. I also knew that there was no explaining what was happening. I knew it was a nightmare. I knew that what I was feeling definitely felt like a human fist. How am I gonna tell my mother this? She's not going to believe me. How am I going to make it sound reasonable? Should I just keep it to myself? And these are the things that were going through my mind because 
you really don't know what you should do about a situation when you have no control. Jennifer decides not to wake her mother. Instead, she moves her bed, hoping that somehow that will protect her. Two nights later. I was going to ask you about that. I was in bed just talking to two friends of mine. I was going to ask you about that. My bed started to shake. So I just immediately yeah, froze. Yeah. And I was so scared because there was no, you can't explain that. The next morning, Jennifer looks for her mother to tell her what's been happening. Hysterical. I was crying. I was very scared. Talk we had to come up with something yeah, because it was just mm -hmm. getting out of hand. Oh, no. Of course, I was in disbelief, yes. and, and I thought she was there. kidding. What do you mean your bed picked up and shook? And she was very solemn and terrified and serious. Bonnie takes Jennifer's story to heart and calls an emergency family meeting. Believe us. Now we're comparing notes, and now we're finding out, oh my God, well, this happened to me, this happened to me, this happened to me. Well, your normal person, something strange happens. You try to rationalize it the best you can. It was just way too much to be coincidence. So it's very scary when you have no idea what you're dealing with. You just know there's something wrong. We were terrified. I mean, it's not every day things like this happen. You just don't expect it. You never think it's going to happen to you. It's going to be okay. Bonnie tells the family she's going to call Ed and Lorraine Warren, a renowned psychic research team famous for helping resolve the Amityville horror. Bonnie feels sure they can help. I was definitely very skeptical about, you know, the Ghostbusters coming to the house and how are they going to really come in and get rid of it. I didn't know how this stuff worked and what they would actually do when they got here. The Warrens visit the house that very night. The two investigators have worked in tandem for more than 30 years and are the authors of nine books on the paranormal. Ed is known worldwide as a religious demonologist, a profiler of occult-related hauntings. Lorraine's psychic ability to detect the presence of spirits has been tested and documented at the University of California at Los Angeles. When I walked in the door, I picked up that something just wasn't right. And it was just an uncomfortable, chilling type experience. She said, oh my, I feel something heavy. It's very heavy. This place is infested. There is such an ominous presence in this house. It just feels like somebody is staring you down very close to your face, like inches away from your face with pure hate and malice that just wants you dead. And that is the most eerie, frightening feeling that you could ever experience. And you can't run away from that. No matter where you go in this house or on the property, it's there. Lorraine investigates the rest of the house. In Jennifer's room, she senses a powerful, negative presence. I knew that that was one bad room. I felt a lot of anger, and I felt a lot of violence. Lorraine reports that the house harbors a dangerous, non-human entity. The family wonders if they should move out until the Warrens can fix the problem. According to the Warrens, even if we got in our car and left, it could follow us. You have to deal with it here. You're helpless. You can't fight it. It's absolutely terrifying. 
The Warrens offer their aid and tell the family that their only real option is to stay and fight. If you just run away from it or try to ignore the fact that it exists, it's going to get worse. You have to take a stand and do everything in your power to fight it and get rid of it. The Warrens tell them that they must first gather more evidence on exactly what they're facing. We told them to keep cameras by their bed. If they would feel something, to try to shoot a photograph. As the Warrens prepare to leave, the family feels both comfort and concern. Is it really going to work? Can they really make this stuff stop? Or is our new house our new hell? Bonnie's mother arrives to share the family's first Thanksgiving in their new home. She's aware of the recent disturbances. She was a very humorous lady, and she would joke around about things and try to make fun almost of the serious situation, just to lighten the mood, to um, just to make us laugh. Late that night, when the family goes to sleep, the grandmother finds herself alone. After witnessing three ghosts in her daughter's home, the terrified grandmother leaves early the next morning. She was shaking. She, uh, she came right out and she told us everything that happened in detail, um, who she saw, what they looked like. Jennifer takes photos of the room in which her grandmother saw the ghosts. The rest of the house was probably about 70, 75. And that room felt like maybe 35 degrees. As promised, the psychic researchers Ed and Lorraine Warren return after Thanksgiving to try to resolve the family's haunting. They're accompanied by two researchers who will attempt to record paranormal phenomena on video and audio equipment. My mom was visiting. A medium named Lee is there in the event that she might be able to communicate with any spirits residing in the house. Bonnie and her husband have arranged for their eight-year-old son to stay with relatives. The TV kept turning off, so she would keep clicking the door. I, I didn't pay any attention. She must have felt something over her shoulder. The family tells the researchers about their grandmother's frightening encounter with ghosts. In the empty room, my mom left. She couldn't stand it anymore. It opened. It, it wasn't just, you know, an old house creek. Oh, my, my mother... Psychic researcher Lorraine Warren. You can be downright scared right out of your mind in these homes by things that can manifest in front of you. Lorraine examines the family's photos for clues about the spirits that inhabit the house. One photo in particular catches her attention. She said, oh my, we have a big problem. I said, that picture, it looks like a glitch in the film. She said, oh no, dear, this is a demon. 
and it's a high level demon. Now I'm even more scared. I mean, now what do we do? Suddenly, Lee begins to tremble uncontrollably. <laughs> She just began to write. You could tell she had no control over her body. A spirit begins to communicate through Lee's writing. Automatic writing in a home like this is very dangerous because it's an open door. It's like welcoming somebody into your home that you really don't want there, but you're being nice and opening the doors and letting the person in that could kill you. At that moment, we were in shock, but at the same time, we all wanted to see what was on that paper. It said, get out, get out, you don't belong, get out, get out, get out, get out, get out. Now, we're even more afraid because now we know, okay, it's been confirmed. They don't like us and they don't want us here. Lee and the Warrens leave for the night. Researcher Mike Roberge and his associate remain behind to gather more data. The only way to know what's really going on in the house is to experience it. Yeah. They set up their equipment in Jennifer's room, where the most violent haunting activity has occurred. Normally, you want to have at least two investigators on site at any point in time. So if something does actually attack the investigators themselves, you can work together to overcome whatever it is the situation is. Too nervous to sleep, the family gathers in the Nobody's kitchen. Staying. They feel trapped. They the Warrens us. have convinced We're them to stay, to but something wants them out. Suddenly, a frigid presence envelops Bonnie. Okay. I lost my breath, like... <sighs> that could drain the energy from me. Jennifer, too, feels the chilling presence. Hair on your arms would stand up. You would feel the chill down your back. You could feel it move from one side of your body to the next. Somebody had walked through the wall into my mother and then through me and out the other side. It's okay. It went through me, too. We just looked at each other like, my God, what just happened to us? When people actually really encounter something supernatural, it hits you in a place that, that nothing else can. It hits you in your soul. And uh, it's, it can be a very scary thing. In Jennifer's room, Mike Roberge and his associate begin recording unnatural noises. It sounded like uh, bird wings fluttering. We're in a closed room. There's no birds in, inside the room. We started hearing uh, rapping in the walls. It sounded like someone was knocking on a door with their fingers. The only difference was uh, it wasn't knocking on the door, it was knocking on the wall, it was knocking on the ceiling, it was knocking on the floor, um, it was knocking everywhere. The researchers attempt to communicate with spirits in the room. Are you here against your will? One knock for yes and two knocks for no. They discover several human entities and one demonic presence. You should let them go. The demonic spirit can and usually does attack people in every aspect possible. Physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, and they try to break down that person. It hits you emotionally in so many different ways. Um, and that's all in, in the effort to try to get you to not want to be here. According to the researchers, the demon, or inhuman spirit, is controlling the three human spirits in the house. Is there something here that's controlling you? If we could get rid of the inhuman spirit that was in the house, it would pretty much release the uh, three other human spirits that were in the house that didn't want to be there in the first place. A few nights later, 
The full research team returns. The family tells them about the spirit that passed through Bonnie and her daughter. So we're getting more scared. We know our house is infested by spirits. We don't know who they are. We don't know what they want. And there's nothing we can do. Just wait and pray to God that nobody gets hurt until hopefully the Warrens could do something to make them stop. She just started shivering. asking this possessing spirit what it wanted there, using Lee as a channel. Ed Warren was asking her questions. First she wrote George, Robert, and Anna. And he continued to ask her questions and repeat himself, who are you? And she put George Robertson down. And he said, what year is it? She wrote one eight and a partial eight, and all of a sudden she stopped writing. Why are you questioning me? Who are you? Get out of here! You don't belong here. We were absolutely terrified. Shut up and leave me alone! In a haunted house. A medium begins to channel an angry spirit. She started to write, and she got three names, Anna, Robert, and George Robertson, a full name, and a partial date, one eight, and uh, just the start of another number. Why are you questioning me? And all of a sudden, Stop. she starts screaming. Why are you asking me all these questions? Shut up and leave me alone and get out of here. You don't belong here. And then she shoves the table into Ed Warren, pinning him against the back door. Shut up and leave me alone! He pushes it back and she continues like jamming it and jamming it into Ed. And she was very violent. And it took a few of the guys to pull her back so she wouldn't hurt him. And we were just all just staring in disbelief and worried about Ed and worried about her because she has no control about what's going on. It was unbelievable. That night, the frightened family sleeps together. The Warrens have told them that the only way to end the haunting is to face it as a family. You feel a feeling of eyes boring through you, like someone is staring you down about two inches away from your face with such hate and malice pure evil and hate, I mean pure evil and hate, that they want you dead. The next day, Bonnie and her daughter Jennifer go to the local town hall to research the names produced by Lee's automatic writing. Who are these people? Uh, why would it come out on paper? And what can we do about it? And that's when we decided to do the research and find out who these people were. Bonnie and Jennifer begin looking through property records from the 1800s, hoping to learn more about the history of their house. I was looking at the books, and I just said, oh my god, Jennifer, come here. You're not going to believe it. And there it was, in black and white. George Robertson owned my house in 1888. When we saw that he owned this house, it was an exciting moment because we knew that what happened with Lee free writing wasn't fake. It wasn't a show that was put on. Sonia, that's not too far from here. It's in the books. He did own our house. You up for a drive? No one came in inquiring about this information. It's real. It's very real. They drive apprehensively to a graveyard, 10 minutes from their house. We walk down into the cemetery, 
and the first gravestone we walked up to, we looked down, it was his. We couldn't believe it. What are the odds? You just walk into a cemetery, look down, and there he is. George Robertson. Looking down and seeing his headstone was, it was just shocking. This, this man was real. Bonnie is unable to learn much more about George Robertson or about the other human spirits haunting the house. A flood in 1955 destroyed many city records of that period. Possibly he just loved this house. It may have been his first home. And maybe that's why his spirit doesn't want to leave. I don't know. That's what's frustrating about it, you don't know. There's so many unanswered questions. Is this what, this is what you gave mom, isn't it? These things? After the visit to the graveyard, the family has a few days of peace. The children wrap Christmas gifts. What was that? The teenagers came bolting down the back staircase terrified. At the same exact time, my son came bolting down the front staircase screaming. They were white as sheets and they were all shaking. Bonnie immediately calls the Warrens, who ask a priest to come out and bless the house. We need to open the windows. The family desperately hopes that the blessing will bring an enduring peace. We were all excited that this was going to be the end of a very long road that we all went through. Psychic researcher Lorraine Warren hopes for the best, but is unsure if this will be enough. Is it going to be lasting? Is it really going to rid the house? Or is it just for now, is this going to be of comfort to them? Or is there a chance, is there just a chance that maybe this will do it? Before he was finished, I asked Lorraine, I said, how do you know if this is gonna work or not? And she just looked at me and said, oh, you'll know, you'll feel it. To everyone in the family, the oppressive atmosphere seems to lift. My hopes were so high because we just had this blessing and we all wanted to know that this was it. A day or two later, Bonnie is overcome by a compulsion to draw. I started getting these images in my head and I come home, I had to get them on paper. I wouldn't even say hello to my family. I would just come in the back door and start drawing. The only thing that I had in my head was this tree. And I just drew the tree, drew the tree, drew the tree. Nothing else, just the tree. Day after day, Bonnie's compulsion intensifies more and more flashes of images, more rapidly coming into my head. I'm obsessed with it. All of a sudden it hit me. Anna was in my head. Anna's haunting spirit was among those revealed through Lee's automatic writing. Bonnie senses that Anna once lost a loved one and suffered through deep mourning. The whole time I was drawing the picture of Anna, I was crying my eyes out. I just felt like I was mourning. I just felt so much pain of missing someone that I loved dearly. And I just cried through the whole thing. I felt the eyes on me again, and I knew it wasn't over. <laughs> Jeremy, stop shining that in my face. Stop. Jeremy, stop it. 
Turn that thing off or I'm going to take it away from you. We were Stop. so terrified. We were all sleeping pretty much in the same room. And Mom. not sleeping maybe an hour, Mom. if that. Jeremy, and having to go to work and function as a normal human being. I gave you a chance. It was pretty much impossible. And trying to stay calm for the kids. And rational. Go to sleep. Everybody go to sleep. Lorraine believes the blessing wounded the negative spirits and left them even more enraged. That usually comes back full strength when it comes back because it's angry. The spirits are very angry at that point. Spirits physically attack the family. Bonnie has had enough. She urgently calls psychic researcher Lorraine Warren. Hey, Lorraine. And she was frightened. She was terrified. She says things are terrible in this house. And so we knew that something more had to be done. She said that she'd already put in a call okay. to a priest to do an exorcism but they have to go through a ritual and fast for a very long time before they can perform it. Guys, I guess three or four more days. The priest agrees to do the exorcism right after Christmas. In the meantime, Bonnie considers moving her family to a motel. Leaving the house is not the answer because what's here is gonna follow you. You have to deal with it. You must deal with it. So there is no escaping. She told us the only way out of this is to hold our ground firmly and fight back. So we decided to do that. This is our home, and I'm not the type of person to give up my home to a dead person. Beckwith stay close together while awaiting the exorcism. Bonnie again finds herself pulled away from the family by an obsessive urge to draw. I can't think of anything else. The images are there, they gotta come out. I had hate, I had fear, and I'm just drawing all over the paper, all of these symbols, and I have no idea what they mean. It doesn't make any sense to me whatsoever, but it's there and it has to come out. Have you been up all night? Yeah. I just have to get it on paper. There's a, a crooked pyramid with light emitting from the top of it. On one side, you have heavenly rays coming down. On the other side, there's a raging storm going on. There's a broken, bleeding heart in it. And there's three spirits. They look like they're floating and reaching up towards the pyramid. Oh. 
Bonnie receives a call from Lorraine Warren. She tells her about her drawing of the three spirits. I asked her if I should be concerned about it, and she explained to me that they were channeling through me and to stop immediately. Bonnie's mother gathers her courage to visit for Christmas. I've been so Mom. worried about you. I'm so glad you're here. How are you? Are you How okay? was your drive? My drive was fine, but... You know, so... Almost immediately, Take it out now. she's attacked by a mysterious fever. 104. The family takes her to the hospital. Doctors find a bizarre, irregular heartbeat and decide to keep her overnight. While the older daughter runs Christmas errands, Jennifer and Bonnie try to comfort their loved one. Sure. Amen. Forever and ever, the glory and the power we from were going to say her prayers with her, as we always did. And she said them backwards. OK, you're, you're fine. You're OK. You're, you're just tying up backwards. I can't do it. And that's when we were really scared. I mean, she said her prayers every night. There was no way she was going to forget her prayers. We were all just very shocked. I'm going to go call a priest. At the same time, the older daughter's Christmas errands are about to take a turn for the worse. Bonnie's mother has been admitted to the hospital with a sudden illness that doctors can't explain. Then, while her older daughter is out doing errands, the car is totaled. She escapes with only minor injuries. It was just too much. First my mother, now my daughter. You know, life-threatening. And I was just shaking all over. Bonnie calls for a priest to check in on her mother. As soon as the priest asked her if she wanted communion, she felt somebody punch her in the stomach. And as soon as the wafer hit her tongue, it stopped, and she felt fine. Three days later, the exorcist arrives at the haunted house to try to cast out its demonic inhabitant. He was very quiet, and it seemed like he was almost disturbed by what was going on in the house. Um, I almost felt like he knew, as soon as he walked through the door, what he was dealing with. Exorcisms can only be performed on people, not places. The priest must attempt a dangerous strategy, using a medium as bait. Since Lee was able to channel spirits in the house on earlier visits, he hopes her presence will lure the demon. Researcher Mike Roberge. We knew that having this spirit possess Lee would give us the advantage that we're looking for. The team restrains Lee. It is the only way to protect everyone from the demon's wrath. During the exorcism, the exorcist is the main target of the possessed person. So uh, the restraints are there to protect not only the person who's the victim, because it's not really them that's doing this, it's the possessing spirit, but also it's there to protect the exorcist. The priest begins with a blessing of the house, which angers and provokes the demon. She was fighting the priest. 
he was saying these prayers and it was trying to stop him. She was screaming at the tops of her lungs, stop praying, stop praying, it's not gonna do you any good. And it was almost like it hurt her. You could tell she was in pain when he was doing the, the exorcism. After a long battle of wills, the demon seems to surrender. The priest made a move towards her and put a blessed cross up to her forehead. She got very quiet, very, very quiet. She got this evil grin on her face. And at that moment, we heard splintering of wood. She broke the legs right off the chair. That's no human spirit that would have the strength to do that. The exorcism continues for almost an hour. And then she seemed to go limp. And you could feel it instantaneously. And the feeling of the eyes bearing down on you was gone. You weren't being watched anymore. The heaviness of the negative energy just left. We were safe for the first time in this house. And it was such a weight lifted off of our shoulders. We could live like normal people again, and I just pray to God it stays this way. Bonnie's prayer seems to be answered, and peace fills her house. But several years later, across the road, developers begin excavating a field. They unearth what seems to be an ancient Native American burial ground. Once again, the family begins to experience unusual phenomena in their home, but nothing that compares to what they had gone through before. We're still trying to figure it out. We probably never will find out the right answers. Was it an Indian burial? We'll never know. Today, the Beckwiths have learned how to deal with their ghostly co-inhabitants. I came into this house pretty much an atheist, and now I've seen the powers of God, I've seen the powers of the devil right before my very eyes. And it's made me a stronger person. darkest shadows and in the most ordinary places. These are the true stories of the innocent and the unimaginable. When the Hinshaw family moves into summer wind, the house speaks to them in whispers. In time, whispers become screams, and buried secrets lead to possession. The family must calm restless spirits before the house consumes them all. Between the world we see and the things we fear, there are doors. When they are opened, nightmares become reality. On the shores of West Bay Lake, Wisconsin, there stood an old mansion, a chamber for restless souls. For 70 years, whoever walked its halls walked side by side with the dead. It's 
the summer of 1969 when Ginger Hinshaw first sets eyes on Summer Wind. It's beautiful. She was visiting a friend who suggested a trip to what the locals refer to as the old haunted house. The mansion had remained vacant for 40 years, home only to bats and the wind. I fell in love with the house immediately. I had to have it. Absolutely wanted that house in the worst way. Felt sorry for the house. Really, really sorry. Ginger is the mother of four young children. She has recently remarried. Having moved many times before, she envisions Summerwind to be the last home her family will ever need. I thought it had great potential on a beautiful site. But everybody kept saying that's the haunted house. And I said, well, fine, then I'm living in the haunted house. Ginger is excited to show the mansion to her family. Her husband, Arnold, owns a construction business and immediately sees the potential of the sprawling estate. Nine-year-old April is less enthusiastic. This place was huge. Dingy, no paint, decrepit. And I'm thinking, we're going to live here. Okay, fix her up. And immediately being possessed of a feeling that I didn't want to be there. Within a month, the family moves in. Ginger and Arnold put all their energy into renovating the old mansion. I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to spare I painted and I wallpapered that whole living room with its beautiful hardwood floor, the mantel back on the fireplace, painted all the woodwork. My mom, she always had that knack for making a house a home warm and fuzzy and pleasant, no matter how much money we had or didn't have. Arnold and Ginger try to find local workers to help with the large tasks. Is there any chance I can get you to bring it up to the house? Nobody wanted to work there. People would drop off parts that we bought. Thanks. They wouldn't even drive in the driveway. They'd leave it there. And then you ask people to come and you know, check this sewer out or find out where the septic is or do any of that. Nope, nobody will come. As soon as you told them where you lived, you dared to mention that, they would not come. One day, while Ginger rummages through the bedroom closet. She discovers the original blueprints for Summer Wind. Honey? And inside it was a peace pipe. The presence of the pipe makes no sense to Ginger. I wonder how old it is. I don't know. It looks great. We should show that to the kids. From that day forward, Ginger becomes inexplicably driven to restore the mansion to its original state. 
as if someone or something is guiding her. That house had to be put back exactly like it was. I was obsessed. I tried 11 different colors of paint to match that woodwork. I had an assignment. I had a job to do. As Ginger fixates on the endless renovations, Arnold begins to lose interest in the house. He would wander around, do things, and then not do things, never finished. But I kept working. As the days pass, Ginger and the rest of the family begin to experience strange phenomena. The chairs would move. They would be there and it would be over there against the wall. No matter what room, what area of the house you were in, you were watched. I always felt that. And I think all the kids felt this. Ginger often has the feeling that she is not alone. But she still refuses to believe her house is haunted. increasingly withdrawn and undergoes a radical change in personality. So he doesn't go to work. And he sits and plays this organ. Daily, nightly. Sleeps all day, stays up all night. Arnold grows angry at the slightest provocation. Girls, which one of you took my hammer? We, we didn't take it. Well, if you didn't take it, why didn't it just walk we off by itself? It. One of you took it. Now, where's my hammer? What are you doing? Trying to drive me crazy? You took my hammer! The window in the master bedroom seems to have a Ginger. mind of its own. Ginger! What? This window is open again. I just closed it 10 minutes ago. It will not stay closed. Well, I didn't do it. Are the kids doing it? I don't think so. They well, I want the window closed. OK, fine. I'll just nail it shut. It's a good idea. Arnold overreacts, blaming Ginger for opening it. I'm thinking he's doing it. He's probably thinking I'm doing it and he wasn't even near it. Shortly thereafter, he quit talking. He wouldn't answer a question. He kept looking around the rooms. He kept walking around the rooms. He'd stand out on the veranda and stare. What do you want? What do you want? Arnold is tormented by something he cannot see. What do you want? What do you want? One day, while Ginger is alone in the house,
Who's there? And it was a male voice, a very deep, strong voice. There's nobody there. So I started up the stairs again. Who's there? Within weeks of moving to Summerwind, something has mysteriously transformed Arnold from a loving husband and father into an insanely angry man. I'm gonna find that raccoon right now! If you did anything to make him mad, you bared the brunt of his anger. It was like he was being possessed. He just seemed to be more evil. Where is that raccoon? One day, the children's pet raccoon escapes launching Arnold into a furious rage. Well, I'm sure it was a mistake. The children were terrified. He was like, just out of it. I'm not going out yes, of the house. Yes, they are. They're going out in the woods and find that raccoon right now. No. Nobody sleeps tonight until that The man Ginger fell in love with has disappeared. Seemingly overnight. And he killed the raccoon as a punishment to my sister. That's how evil he was. So we've been working a long time. Ginger tries hard to regain a sense of normalcy in her life. It's been a labor of love, but I've... She invites some friends for a visit, trying to put the house and Arnold's strange behavior out of her mind. Cheese and crackers? Okay, I'll be right back. see a ghostly form. I will never forget their faces. And I've never talked to them again. Ginger can no longer deny what's happening in her house. That's when I first knew it wasn't just me. Knowing she's not insane is little consolation. Arnold descends further into madness his playing sounding more and more demonic. It just seemed to possess him. The song started to change. The song started to be more evil. He just went berserk. Totally lost it. Lost the business, lost himself, lost it all. Why don't you 
Just stop. It's the only pleasure I get. Leave me alone. Do you have any idea what time it is? I don't care. Just leave me alone. Well, what about your children? I don't care. Leave me alone. They I like to play. They need their sleep, too. Just go back to sleep. Stop. I'm gonna... April and her sister blame the house for Arnold's insanity. They reach a point of desperation. What nine-year-old and ten-year-old child wants to kill themselves just to escape? I don't know of any. Stop it! Just leave me alone. I want to keep playing. How long are you going to do this? All right, if I have to, I like it. I knew my mom loved us, and I knew she was struggling, and I knew my stepdad hated us and hated her. He didn't before. And he cared for us before. He didn't there. Ginger often seeks refuge in the nearby woods. She is unable to cope with whatever is haunting summer wind. Terrified to be in her own home. As winter approaches, life at Summerwind is nearing a crisis. Our bedrooms weren't warm, so we'd have to haul all our mattresses down to the living room by the fireplace and our blankets and sleep everybody in the living room just to stay warm. Arnold has stopped speaking to everyone in the family. He's lost his business. We're losing money and we're going down the drain. Both the heat and electricity are shut off when bills go unpaid. A broken pump forces the family to carry water from the lake. You start to set your life to what's a priority. How valuable is the furniture versus warmth and survival? I hated the wind, and I hate the wind till this day. Ginger is finally at the breaking point. Pride has kept her from asking her father for help, but pride is giving way to fear. She walks to a neighbor's house and makes the call. Bring the camper, come and get me. I can't do this anymore. Grandpa! I remember my grandfather coming to the house and it was like a war was over. I don't have to deal with this anymore. Everybody just sighed. Arnold stays behind. He'll leave Summerwind the next day. But for Ginger, this is goodbye. Whatever chances they might have had together were destroyed by the mansion. The family never hears from him again. I told him exactly what happened, all of it, everything. And I felt like he did not believe me. I wasn't into haunted houses. I wasn't into uh, uh, the paranormal, the spiritual world. You hear stories and you listen, but you also listen with a skeptic's perspective. 
when fear steps in, there are no boundaries. Uh, fear just takes over the whole person. Ginger hopes that Summer Wind is finally out of her life. Little does she know, she's about to pass the torch to her father. It is the spring of 1972. Ginger and her children are living in Canada. She spends most of her time learning about the world of the paranormal, hoping to find answers about the haunting of Summer Wind. I was into everything I could get my hands on to read. Everything. I was obsessed with what happened. And I know everybody said, oh, it's because you're having hard times and you're stressed and you're this and that. Yeah, well, I've had hard times all my life. But that didn't make it every house I lived in was haunted. But this one was. Ginger vows never to return to Summerwind. But for some reason, her father cannot get the place out of his mind. Summer wind looked like it uh, needed somebody. It, it's like seeing a wet puppy. You you want to comfort it, and that house almost reached out to you and asked for comfort. Raymond convinces the new owner, Mrs. Murray, to show the old mansion to him and his son Ray, no. who's just returned from the Vietnam War. No, this is a. She repurchased the house from Ginger and often brings people to the property, but never goes inside. Ray was recently discharged from duty and is looking for a project to occupy his time. Like his father, he is instantly drawn to the house. Architecturally, it didn't fall into any known design that I had ever seen before. It was like a mixture of all different architectural styles. But just the condition that it appeared in and the way it sat in the clearing, it just seemed to say, help me. You looked at it and said, boy, there, you know, I could do something with this. This could be really, really something nice. Let's take a look inside. Whew. A little fixer upper, but I think we can. Yeah. Both father and son envision converting the mansion into a hotel and restaurant. Wow. Look at this place. Yeah. The place has been ravaged by vandals and bad weather. I think we can do something with it. I think we found exactly what we're looking for. But this wow. does not dampen their enthusiasm. We were both pretty experienced in, you know, the basic renovation stuff. My dad is a pretty good carpenter, and uh, I do a lot of plastering and stuff like that. Both men sense something eerie about the hulking mansion. Hey. Hey. There's a mysterious chill in the air. I think you got it made. Something else. Nevertheless, Raymond decides oh, yeah. to buy it. Uh, don't worry about it. He will soon discover he's purchased much more than an old house. Raymond is determined to buy Summerwind despite Ginger's warnings that it's haunted. How you doing? 
He tries to break the news to her gently. We just got back from the Northwoods. Dad, no, you didn't. You, you can't buy that place. Are you crazy? Don't you remember what happened there? I was so angry. On, Judge, I mean, I, I know you I are. said, why did you do no, that? Dad, I'm talking about the spirits there. By that time, I was a little tongue-in-cheek. Oh, uh, yeah, ghost, I'm sure. Yeah, right on. You can't buy that place. Are you crazy? He said, nah. It's okay. Ray needed a project. What are you talking about? Spirits. It's just... They got a project, all right. They got a real project. No, I'm serious, Dad. You can't buy that place. I found out from my mom, and I was angry. Because I didn't want him to suffer. You'll have bad luck, too. Jedra, come on. It's... That place possessed its own evil. And I knew it as a nine-year-old child. And what nine-year-old child would know that? I did. Ray begins renovating Summerwind on his own. He calls several local contractors to help him. Initially, their response was, oh, not a problem. We'd be glad to do it. As soon as I would mention where it's at, at this old mansion out on the lake, their attitude would change completely. Oh, well, we're, we're way too busy. Maybe we could look at it next year, possibly. Uh, we don't usually handle projects of that size. I got that two or three times, and I just gave up. Ray's first day of work ends without incident. But that night, the eerie growl of bears sends shivers up his spine. Something frightens Ray so profoundly, he cannot speak about it to anyone. What are you doing on sir? Lumber broke. When I got home, I just told him, well, I broke the lawnmower, I broke the chainsaw, I couldn't get anything done. And I'm home. That's it. That's end of story. I didn't tell him what happened. I didn't tell him what I had seen. It's just, it's just not working. Everything's... I'm just home, all right? It's clear that something has gone terribly wrong at the mansion. And the fact that Ray will not talk about it disturbs his father. Raymond decides to pay a visit to Mrs. Murray. Tell me whose husband bought Summerwind from its original yeah, owner, a Mr. Patterson. He asks her what she knows about Summerwind's strange history. It was the early 1930s. Mrs. Murray says that the Patterson servants complained that the house was haunted, but nobody believed them, least of all Mr. and Mrs. Patterson. One night, the couple was home eating dessert. The shots passed through the entity without any effect. Mr. Patterson and his wife left that very night and never returned. Raymond is intrigued by Mrs. Murray's story. 
when you're talking about ghosts and spirits, what measurements do you use? You don't use, there's no textbook really on ghosts and spirits. You're talking about a dimension that nobody can really pinpoint or figure. Raymond believed that Ginger's tales of ghosts haunting the old mansion stemmed from fear and superstition. But now, he is unsure what to think. Ginger visits her father, hoping to convince him to abandon his plans for Summerwind. Okay, look, let's look this over. This is what I have to decide. We went out, we've done some work, and here are the plans. But he's already invested in drawing up blueprints. Okay, let me show you so you can be convinced what a great idea this is. We're going As Raymond talks endlessly about his vision for the old mansion, Ginger's brother becomes more and more nervous. The whole place a resort area, and uh, this is the grand ballroom. Okay? Ginger can see that something's wrong with him. She tells him she's been studying hypnosis and that perhaps she can help him with his nail biting. Ray agrees to give it a try. My sister uh, held up a pen in front of me and told me to concentrate on it. Focus on this pen. Would you just look at it? Or? As soon as I started getting a little bit uh, droopy, she put me into like a half asleep state, and the next thing I knew, I was asleep. Concentrate on my voice. She was talking in generalities, general things, to relax him. And then she was talking about the mansion. And I remember my uncle's leg shaking and shaking really hard and I remember thinking he's afraid and his voice changed I am strong I am strong Hey, where are you? He was no longer my uncle anymore He was somebody else Ray, where are you? And I was looking at him going Answer go? me, Ray. Where are you? Talk to me. Where did you go? Strong. My children. Where did you go? Ray, talk to me. Ginger. And this voice comes out and says, You are weak. I am strong. My children. It wasn't my brother at all. Ray, talk to me. Ginger is afraid she's unleashed something she cannot contain. I am strong. The cross and the power of this cross release you of this possession. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, and earth is it in heaven. She commands the spirit to leave. Give us this name, would you leave me? I felt just a slight bit of a headache, but everybody in the room around me was in shock. Ranting, you the power or something. What was going on? What? Don't you remember? No. What happened? My father was probably the ultimate skeptic. <laughs> he tried to dismiss it all as overactive imaginations. We recorded it, man. We play it back. On the tape, it was very frightening, very demanding voice, and very angry voice. And made statements that he was very old, that he despised weakness of any kind, uh, despised his children, of which I had none. He said, I had seven children and they are all weak and I am very strong. Ray has experienced something he cannot explain. It compels him to finally reveal what happened to him at Summerwind. When I was back at the house, 
I mean, that's why, that's why I left. I, I was working. I was upstairs in the hallway. Uh, I was totally alone. There was nobody around. Who's there? Shots sounded like they'd come from downstairs. Went into the kitchen and thought I smelled gunpowder. Dismissed it, looked around, saw no one. It had just rained the night before. There were no tracks around other than mine. Couldn't imagine somebody shooting that close that could disappear that quickly. At the door leading to the basement, I noticed two holes. And I knew they were bullet holes. The bullet holes looked like they'd been there for many years. I was rattled. I had seen the bullet holes. I had smelled the gunpowder. I had heard the voices. leaves Ray shaken. I was the kind of person, I didn't believe in ghosts. I didn't believe in the spirit world. I didn't, I thought that was all hogwash. Uh, that was good Hollywood stuff. Uh, everybody likes a good ghost story. But actually having one happen, I didn't know exactly what was going on. So that's, that's what happened. No one is more stunned by Ray's tale than his father. Uh, he immediately recognizes a connection to the Patterson story and shares match. it with his family. Well, he uh, fired uh, two shots off at, uh, at a ghost. What? Where'd you hear that? Well, I went back to Miss Murray and uh, I asked her about what was going on and she He's said convinced she there's a powerful force years. trying to communicate. Yeah, I'm absolutely sure and asks Ginger to hypnotize him. Raymond's now determined to unravel the mansion's secrets, despite what happened to his son under hypnosis. When you count backwards from 10. It takes longer to put her father under. But eventually, Ginger succeeds. Is it summer wind? Yes. In his mind's eye, Raymond finds himself at Summer Wind and descends into the basement. Concentrate on the sound of my voice. Something in it. A box. A wooden box. What's inside the box? Can you get the box? What's inside the box? You to write what's inside the box. I watched him write like you would write with a quill on parchment. finds a land grant written in 1767. 
Ginger asks him if he can determine the owner. He looks closer, then carefully writes a name he sees at the bottom of the document. I'm going to bring you back. Jonathan Carver. Okay, I'm going to bring you back now. Five. Four. Three. Two. One. Raymond remembers nothing about his hypnotic journey. What happened? And although the family has no idea who Jonathan Carver might be, who is that? They now have a name and a date. What's this? For the first time, the family has clues that could help them solve Summerwind's elusive mystery. Raymond begins to research the name Jonathan Carver at the public library. He discovers that Carver was a well-known explorer in the late 1700s. I did further research and uh, come to find out he was quite a uh, colonial figure. Jonathan Carver's crowning achievement was a peace he negotiated between two warring Native American tribes. After his death, his children claimed that tribal chiefs rewarded Carver with a huge parcel of land on which Summerwind was later built. But his descendants could not find any documents to verify the claim. Ginger wonders, could Carver's land grant be hidden at the mansion. Jonathan Carver wanted his land grant found. It was the ghosts that were in the house that were trying to explain to me what to do, and I was just not smart enough to get it. Well, there was no doubt in our mind that a box existed somewhere in Summerwind. We all were convinced that the box must be there. It, it had to be. It was so clear in my dad's mind. I was fearful. I was fearful we were walking in an area that we had no control over. It wasn't a case of, can we find a box? We knew exactly where the box was. We pulled some stones out, and there was a space behind them. But lo and behold, there was nothing in that space. Uh, the box is in there? No, I don't feel anything. There, there was no box there. there. There's nothing? You can't see anything up in there? No, I don't feel anything. It was total disappointment to uh, dig in that stairway and not find the box. You can't imagine how far we fell in, uh, in the abyss of disappointment. This is where I know I saw it. This is the place. We went through the entire house after that. Through every 
possible nook and cranny we could think of. We went from attic to basement, inside, outside, all over the house. The box is nowhere to be found. Frustrated, the family realizes they have chased the answer to a mystery far too long, and it has consumed them all. They must try to protect what's left of their sanity, to free themselves from a place that's tormented everyone who's ever lived there. They finally leave Summerwind and never return. On a stormy summer night in 1988, lightning strikes Summerwind multiple times, and the old mansion burns to the ground. Today, these ruins are all that remain. Neither Carver's descendants nor historians have ever found the original deed. Did it ever exist? Did Jonathan Carver's spirit have some sort of master plan? Or was he ever here at all? The truth will forever remain a mystery. But what happened to this family will haunt them until the day they die. When it did burn down, it was cleansing. I could feel a relief and I felt the evil was gone. I would never go back. Burned or not burned, I will never go back.